Uh, let's uh, ask for a blessing on this time together. And Praveen, as usual, will lead us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bless your name, Lord, for giving us this time. Uh, we could meet our brethren in our comfort zones through this online medium, Lord. As we're going to spend some time in the meditation of your word, Lord, I pray that you open our hearts and minds so that we may be sensitive to receive and perceive and receive what you want to communicate to us, Lord. Especially, we request you to speak through your servant, reveal yourself to us, and especially in us, O Lord. The time we spend, the discussions we make, Lord, may mutually edify us and also bring glory to your name, Lord. Thank you very much for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, the subject we're going to discuss uh, is, the way I've titled it is, How to Understand Judgment in the Bible. And the reason I've titled it that way is, I begin to see that the Bible presents judgments very, very widely. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, one moment. Uh, can I just, yes. I was just, uh, uh, Praveena, it, the, the screen is okay. You, you, you spotlighted, but am I okay? With, uh, I moved to the uh, full screen. So uh, the gallery view, is that okay? Yeah, but all right, let me begin. <laughs> Uh, the subject we are going to discuss today is uh, titled How to Understand Judgment in the Bible. And uh, just to uh, remind you that this is this was rather part of the series that we had started some time back on the subject called eschatology, which is the study of last things. So we are going to uh, do a small section on the final judgment, so the study of last things. But the way I've titled my sermon, or rather the Bible study today, is that when I began to see judgment being used in so many different contexts or having different contexts, uh, the Bible uses the word judgment very, very widely. So what I thought of doing was today take a comprehensive view of it, comprehensive as much as possible. Obviously, it's not going to uh, encompass everything the Bible has to say, but give you a glimpse or perhaps maybe a, a bird's eye view of the bigger picture of, uh, this, of uh, the subject of judgment. So I am going to be reading a lot of scriptures. <laughs> I hope uh, that doesn't throw you off. Uh, I obviously couldn't put all of them on the screen. So if you should want to refer you know, in the, in the Bible, so you may want to have a Bible handy. I'm not sure if we would have, you know, you would have time to turn to each one of these, but, but I will certainly read it and you can um, definitely recall uh, the particular scriptures that I'm going to read. So let me first di discuss judgment on two levels. One is judgment used in various contexts, multiple contexts in the scriptures. That is one section I'm going to deal with. Secondly, uh, I'm going to discuss judgment from a past, present, and future aspect, right? Interestingly enough, the Bible does have, or rather presents judgment, not only from a final judgment perspective, but judgment also from uh, something that happened in the past, as well as a, an ongoing judgment. So we will look at those two. And then I'm going to bring in some conclusions, uh, conclusions as I call it, uh, what we can, conclusions in the sense that what we can say dogmatically and some inferences, which means what we may not be able to say dogmatically, what we might not be able to know, know fully. And then I will end with, the final judgment of God, and I hope that should be interesting for you uh, to anticipate. Okay, let me take in, uh, get into that first level. Judgment used in multiple contexts, and 
And that is something interesting that I found as I kept reading. For example, let's begin with uh, something that uh, should be obvious, but some, perhaps something we don't think of. We, we always attribute judgment to God, but do you know that, I mean to say, God allows humans to judge, right? Deuteronomy chapter one and verse 17, I'm reading, uh, it says, you shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone for the judgment is God's. And the case that is too hard for you, you shall bring it to me and I will hear it. So interesting, isn't it? There is a, uh, I mean, uh, especially the nation of Israel was uh, asked to disseminate judgment. And it gives you the parameters of how you judge. What does Jesus say with regards to humans judging? In John chapter 7 and verse 24, John 7 Verse 24, he says, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. And I'm presuming that these are mostly from the new uh, international version. So judgment is also something that humans do. It's not just, you know, God. So I just wanted to bring you that perspective. Now, secondly, humans are judging, but humans will also be judged. Let me give you two scriptures there. One is from Romans chapter two and verse one, it says, but I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Uh, I think uh, this sounds a bit, uh, you know, intimidating. Every word that uh, they have spoken, uh, uh, obviously we don't have time to, you know, uh, to do an exegesis on this, but, but, uh, humans will be judged. There is no doubts about that. It talks about a day of judgment. All right. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, it says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Something to notice here. Many times judgment is used in, very, in ways that they sometimes coincide. You know, it talks about the day of judgment. Then it talks about the judgment seat of Christ. Are they all different? Uh, I don't think so. Maybe they are, but I, I sometimes feel many of this sort of uh, 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 collide or collapse into each other. They, they sort of coincide. They are they are the same thing being described in different ways. Okay, so let's just keep those things in mind. All right, now we are looking at the context in which the word judgment is used in the scriptures. Let me go to the third context, faulty judgments. In other words, the Bible says we have to be very careful that we don't provide faulty judgments. And I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, it says, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Here is an indictment uh, on uh, you know, the readers that we have to be careful that if we are going to pass judgment, uh, that we are not guilty of the same things we pass judgment on. I want you to notice an interesting point here. If God expects for us to not be hypocritical, right, uh, by condemning others, question for us to ask is, can God also pass righteous judgment? I'm, so you, I'm sure you'll say yes, but he is, he's righteous in his judgment making sure that he doesn't expect from us what he doesn't expect from himself. So just a point for you to keep in mind. All right. So faulty judgment. Let's move to uh, the next one. Judgment from, uh, for judgment for restoration. The context here is restoration or restorative, right? And retribution or destruction of sinfulness. 
there are two, both the contexts are, are given here. Judgment is used in the context of restoration and judgment is also used in the context of retribution or destruction. Let me read you some scriptures there. John 3 verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The word condemn is obviously a judgment passed on someone who has uh, faltered. Uh, and so if you notice, God's perspective of judgment is restoration. All right. He does not want to condemn. So judgment is used in the context of restoration. But notice what Romans 6 and verse 23 says. Romans 6 verse 23 says, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. Uh, one, it sounds a bit eerie and, uh, you know, foreboding. Punishment on the day of judgment, that is retribution. So judgment is also being used in the context of retribution. But how do we understand that? Now, that, of course, is something that we may have to do another time. All right, let me give you two more contexts in which judgment is used. Uh, judgment as natural consequence. Okay, judgment as a natural consequence. I'm reading from chapter, uh, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, um, I'm not sure if I got the scripture right, but I'll read, the, I'll read what I wanted to read for you. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I may have made a mistake in, the, uh, in, in copying the, uh, the reference. But the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Notice, the wages of sin is a natural consequence. So the judgment here of death being passed is a natural consequence of sin. It does not say that God is you know, uh, actually punishing the person with death. It doesn't say that. It says the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. One more scripture, looking at uh, judgment from a natural consequence, Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But verse 17, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. It assumes that it is a consequence, a, a consequence that follows, a natural consequence that follows. It doesn't say, in the day you eat of it, I will kill you. Jesus or our God doesn't say that. It's a natural consequence of a choice that we have made. In other words, we have brought judgment upon ourselves. So when, when we talk of judgment as a natural consequence, it's not God who is dishing out the judgment, but it is we who are actually attracting judgment upon ourselves. One more context in which judgment is used. And this is a, a, actually a wonderful scripture. Uh, and uh, I will explain a little bit more a little later. Uh, all judgment is given to the son. The father says, I have given all judgment to the son. John 5 and verse 22 says, the father, the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son. In other words, the judge in the ultimate analysis will be none other than the savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Interesting, isn't it? He is the savior of the world, but he judges. And the question is, how does he judge? And that is something we will see uh, towards the later part as we reach to the end. Okay, did you see now, what I've done to you, uh, with you is, I've given you the various contexts in which the word judgment is used. Uh, uh, now, there are more, many more. I sim simply didn't have the you know, the time, and obviously we won't have the time to do uh, a complete comprehensive analysis of the various contexts, but I just want you to appreciate that this is not a simple subject. 
Uh, it's a fairly complex subject, and look and look and, and when you look at it from these different contexts, you see uh, various aspects of this being given to us, uh, and helps us to understand judgment from various ways. Now, let's go to that second level I was mentioning to you about. Judgment is uh, not only in these various contexts we looked at, but it also we can also look at judgment from a past, present, and a future aspect also, all right? Let's look at, uh, I'm going to give you uh, some thoughts on the past. John 6 and verse 11 says, and I am, you know, it's a breaking into a thought. It says, and about judgment, John 6, 6 sorry, it's John 16, verse 11. John 16, verse 11. And about judgment. Because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Some translations also have judged. Right? The prince of the world uh, of now stands judged or condemned. That's a past event for us. The prince of the world, I'm sure you will recognize him as, uh, as uh, you know, Satan, the devil, has already been judged. So there is a judgment pa already passed. Right. Secondly, sin. Sin has been judged in the person of Jesus. And that's the reason why we are free today. Because the sins of the world has been taken away by the Lamb of God. That's a past event for us. Right. Uh, so sin has been judged. Satan has been judged. Sin has been judged. It's all in the past. One more thought. Death has been judged. I specifically say death because death is the, is the wages of sin. When sin is, uh, what you say, judged, death has, has also been judged. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as, and verse 54. Uh, death is swallowed up in victory. Death has been canceled. Death has been taken away. Right. So a judgment has been passed upon death. So in that respect, uh, judgment is used in the past tense, something that happened in the past. Now let's move to the present. Uh, is there judgment today? Is there a continuing judgment taking place, unfolding? Yes, there is. The Bible definitely alludes to that. Look at the moral breakdown in society today, right? The moral breakdown, which leads to its painful consequences, right? What are they? They are nothing more but the present judgments of our choices. As we live and make choices, we attract either a penalty to it, a, a, a judgment that leads to a penalty or a, or a judgment that can lead to righteousness, right? Uh, uh, let me see. Um, uh, Romans chapter one, I, I won't take the time to read exactly what, it, what uh, you know, the chapter says. I'm sure many of you would have read it in the past, but very clearly God says in Romans one, God gives us over to our choices. God gives us over to our choices. And when we exercise our choice, we are exercising judgment, you know, because there are consequences to our choices. And to that extent, we are attracting some kind of judgment, which we, which we, may, uh, we may suffer now. So this is the present aspect of the concept of judgment. Now, interestingly enough, judgment can also lead to learning. God's judgments teach us righteousness. And you have heard many a times of God's discipline. He disciplines those whom he loves. That is a type of judgment. If I can read to you Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 9. Isaiah 26 and verse 9, it says, My soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. When your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness. And I can't help but recognize that and understand that as 
God's judgments that is unfolding today and, and constantly you know, taking place, helping us to learn righteousness. Right? So that is the present perspective of judgment as judgment is being rolled out today. Well, there is also a future element to judgment. All right. A judgment of reward. We are very clearly told in the scriptures that there is a judgment that leads to a reward. Uh, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, the apostle Paul talks about uh, a judgment that leads to a reward. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, notice the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who long for his appearing. That is a future uh, judge or judgment being used in a future tense or in a future perspective. Right now, uh, there is also a judgment that will end up in destruction. The Bible is clear about that. There is a that judgment that leads to destruction. In other words, all opposing powers are put down at a point in time when everything that opposes, uh, you know, that all that God stands for has to be, you know, destroyed, you could say, or put down. And let me read you Second uh, Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. It says in Second Peter 3 verse 7, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exists are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Destruction of the ungodly. So do you see, I've given you a past, present, and future element of judgment. So judgment can be looked at in these different ways. In earlier, I also gave you judgment being used in various contexts, right? So uh, how do you understand judgment? And I want to just give you a very simple perspective on this. To understand the subject of judgment, as especially as how the Bible uh, reveals it, uh, you have to understand it from the context in which it is being used, all right? Because judgment is, uh, is you know, is, is, is spoken of in various perspectives, situations. It could be, uh, it could be referring to humans being the judge. It could be a judgment that is restorative. It could be a judgment that is retributive, which is destructive. It could be a judgment that is a natural consequence. Uh, it can also be a judgment that is already done in the past, a judgment that is being done now, and a judgment that will come in the future, right? And of course, in all of this, you have to see who is the judge, right? So to understand uh, judgment, you have to look at all of these contexts. Now, let me go now more into the, uh, maybe I will do a, a summarization of some of these, and then we will look at the eschatology of judgment, in other words, the study of the last things, right? How we can look at the final judgment. Now, what are some conclusions we can make from all these scriptures that we have read? I believe you can make some Conclusions which are for certain. In other words, you can be dogmatic in some aspects of this subject of judgment. On the other hand, you may also have to recognize that some, some, uh, in some ways judgment is used, you cannot be dogmatic. You cannot, you may only make some inferences. You may need to speculate, right? In other words, you don't have the final word on exactly what it might actually mean and what it could entail. In other words, <laughs> uh, I keep coming back to this. There are some things we just don't know about judgment. 
all right? So, and then after that, I will move into the final judgment of God, how I understand it and how I'm presuming GCI understands it uh, from what I have read. Uh, right, so we are, we are at point one. Uh, conclusions. These are dogmatic conclusions. Since humans are created with the capacity and freedom to make choices, judgment is a natural part of existence, cannot be avoided. In other words, choices, ex uh, choices exercised with freedom will have consequences. That is one thing we need to understand, that we have the freedom of will, we are created in that way, and hence judgment becomes part of our existential reality, right? Judgment is not something that we can just wish away. Point number two, God wants Christians to understand the truth of the judgments. And how does he want us to understand it? To both comfort and motivate them to godly living. Not to necessarily scare them or fear or, or, or make, make them fearful of it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Let's understand that God, in his, uh, you know, giving judgment, uh, he's trying to motivate us, or he's also trying to bring comfort. The comfort is the restorative perspective, but also motivate us to godly living, that when we understand and know that there is a retributive aspect to judgment, we will be motivated to live godly, all right? So that's point number two. Point number three. God wants us to judge our sins in the sense of confessing it. In other words, he wants us to be the judge of our own sins so that we bring it to God for destruction. What does 1 John 1, 1 and verse 8 say, says? It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins and confession needs a, a, a certain aspect of judgment. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Notice that. Purify us. He will destroy it. He will remove the sin that we are struggling with. Right? So he wants us to also exercise judgment in the sense that he wants us to confess it. All right? Uh, let's go to the next point. What, what we can dogmatically say is God is for us. Judgment helps us to understand that God is for us. Wants to help us avoid the certain consequences of decisions contrary to spiritual reality. I just explained point number one. Judgment is part of a spiritual reality, that, that, of our existential reality that we have to accept. But what we need to understand is judgment uh, helps us to recognize God is for us. He's not against us. Notice John 3 and verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So judgment is done not as a, uh, uh, a, a you know, a compulsion to condemn, but uh, wanting a sense of restoration. He wants all to be restored. And that is something we can definitely conclude about uh, judgment from a biblical perspective. Let's look at one more point in this uh, section. Those who repose their faith in Christ need not fear the final judgment. Why? Because Christ was judged for us in our place. What does John 5, 24 say? Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. What a, what a reassuring statement that is. So those of us who repose our faith in Christ need not fear the final judgment from the words that Jesus himself quotes uh, and John records for us, that we have we do not, uh, he does not come into judgment, but has passed from, passed from death to life. Okay, so those are some dogmatic statements I believe we can make from uh, the subject of judgment in the Bible. Now, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll just, uh, my, my 
I'll just stop sharing there because uh, uh, my notes are a bit sketchy and uh, as I read it, <laughs> I don't want to confuse you. But now let us go to the section where I said we cannot be dogmatic. Uh, what I mean to say is we cannot, we cannot uh, have the final word on it. There is an element of ambiguity. We may have to leave it to another time in the fullness of time for us to understand some of these things. And these are some of them. The, ju the word the, the judgment also brings in the thought of rewards. What are rewards? Right? Uh, are they graded rewards? In other words, first prize, second prize, third prize, <laughs> gold, silver, medal, <laughs> silver, bronze. Uh, you know, I don't know. The Bible talks about somebody who will be least in the kingdom, somebody who will be great in the kingdom. What does it mean? I, I don't know. So judgment brings in these perspectives, and I think there is an element of ambiguity there. Secondly, judgment also talks, uh, retributive judgment talks about punishment. Question, does God punish? Well, the scriptures seem to indicate that God punishes, but does God punish? And if he punishes, does he punish for eternity? You know, there is a, there is a difficulty there. Why is there a difficulty there? Uh, because God's heart is that he does not desire any to be lost, but all to be saved. He loves sinners. He also tells us that he loves I mean to say he asks us to love enemies, that he, he also loves enemies, in other words. Right? There is a scripture which says, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. So Christ, God loves sinners. Now, if he loves sinners, if he loves enemies, does he punish in a manner, in a way where someone will be in pain and agony and screaming for all eternity? I don't know. I mean, uh, that, 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 uh, it, it bends my mind to, to recognize that. I look at my own children. I have punished my children. <laughs> I gave, gave them spanks, you know, uh, at times. But I would never think in terms of seeing my children punished for all eternity. That seems almost sadistic and cruel. Now, am I missing something there? Probably I am, but I can only tell you that I am not sure what this, what this actually means, right? Now, I do believe when you talk about punishment and retribution, I do believe that God gives us over to our choices and our desires. If we desire not to have him or have him in our life, he allows for us to have that. And the natural consequences, agony. Now, in that respect, I can understand. But God inflicting punishment to such an extent where he is literally making people scream, you know, by torturing them, I, I have a hard time recognizing that. Right? Uh, now, I understand that God disciplines us, but he disciplines us in a way where we can learn righteousness, but I don't think I understand his punishment as the way we humans put it. Punishment for eternity, screaming all the time. I, I, I have a hard time about that. Now, a third point here. What about God's wrath? We talk, and the Bible talks about God's wrath. His wrath will be poured down upon the ungodly and, of course, all the sinners. I, I understand God's wrath as against all evil, evil that hurts and destroys good and good people, right? Uh, in other words, God's wrath is an expression of his love, not an expression of hatred because there is no hatred in God. God is love. He's not a combination of love and hatred, all right? So that is uh, something that once again, there are some ambiguities there. Now, the Bible talks about the great white throne judgment. Have you heard of that? <laughs> the great white throne judgment. What does that mean? 
right? Maybe I'll just go to my screen there and just share with you the scripture from the book of uh, Revelation. Uh, the great white throne judgment. Let's read from the book of Revelation chapter 20. It says, then I saw a great white throne and the one who sat on it, the earth and the heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead great and small standing before the throne and books were open. Also another book was open, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And all were judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death and the lake. The, uh, this is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay. Now, my question. Uh, it's very interesting to read this, but I confess I don't fully understand this. What are these books? <laughs> right? What are these books? There are books open, then there are book of life open. If I have, if you have the book of life and my name is written in the book of life, then why should there be works? Because uh, there is, we understand and know that salvation is not by works. Right? Why is there all of that? These are all mysterious. They are mysteries for us. And I don't think we understand. And notice I put them all in the, in, in the yellow highlight. But there is one interesting thing about this. Notice the last uh, highlight. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Isn't that interesting? Death and Hades. Hades, uh, a crude translation could be hell. Uh, were thrown into the fire. Which means to say the ultimate destruction of evil takes place. This is a reference to the ultimate destruction of all that causes the pain and the suffering and, of course, and all the uh, difficulty that we see today. So there is a judgment that will finally, uh, what you say, confine death, sin, Hades, evil, suffering, all of that stuff into the lake of fire, which means to say a final destruction. Okay, now I'm coming to my final part and I'll end with this. We'll get into our discussion. The final judgment of God, okay? Uh, I'll uh, keep this on the screen. Notice who is going to be the judge finally? The judge will be Jesus Christ because Father has given judgment to Jesus Christ. What is the judgment? The final judgment, and this is how I am putting it. The final judgment of God is... All humans are loved, forgiven, and embraced by God. And I believe that is a, the restorative aspect of uh, judgment. This is how God has judged human beings. That he loves them. He has forgiven them in Jesus Christ our Lord. He's embraced them in the Holy Spirit. And he, and he has made, opened the doors of the kingdom wide open to all. Okay? That is, I believe, the the one of the final judgments of God. Third point, those who submit to that reality enters the eternal kingdom of God. But fourth point, those who refuse to accept consign themselves to a condition of self-imposed torment and they will experience God's love as rats because God is love and he never stops being loved. He will even show love to those who opposes him, but they will experience his love as, as wrath, not, uh, you know, as love. And finally, the final judgment of God, evil has been judged. Sin and death are finally consigned to the lake of fire, destroyed forever. All right, I think I've said enough, and I'm going to open it up to a whole plethora of questions that you might have. I won't be able to answer every one of those, uh, but well, let's open it up. Here goes. I notice Anil is not there. I, I presume he'll be back soon. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, may I ask you something, please? Hila, go ahead. Yes, you're the first one. Uh, can you tell me what is the difference between judgment and condemnation? Or is there a difference at all? Uh, okay. 
<laughs> you know, I can only resort to my English. I mean, how I understand it in English, a, a, a judgment can be a judgment of condemnation or a judgment of restoration or a judgment of reward. So uh, the way I would explain it is condemnation uh, is the, uh, no, rather judgment precedes condemnation, right? I don't know if I'm, I'm putting this correctly. Uh, uh, condemnation is what follows, right? But judgment as such can be also something for good, right? Something restorative. So that's how I explain it. Does that make sense, Sheila? Uh, yeah. Now, suppose uh, I see somebody telling lies constantly or uh, stealing, and uh, I say, okay, he's a thief or he's a liar, but I'm not condemning that he'll go to hell uh, and face eternal death or whatever. So isn't there a difference between, I mean, that you can judge because you can see uh, the person is doing wrong. That is a kind of judgment when I say, okay, he's like this, he's like that, but I'm not condemning that he'll go to hell. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, I think when you call somebody a thief, you are making a judgment. <laughs> Obviously, you are making a judgment, but um, uh, you may also, you're, you're making a judgment of truth. That could be a truthful statement, right? Now, uh, the condemnation will follow, but I'm, I'm presuming that you don't want to go that far, right? And you leave it to the, uh, to the mercies of God. Does that make sense again? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's, uh, it's, 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 it's kind of difficult. You know, I'm presuming that you are afraid to say that he's a thief. Are you saying that, is it okay for me to say he's a thief? Is that, how, is that your real question? No, but you can't help saying, if you see that he has been stealing often and you find that he's, you know, constantly doing this or regularly doing this wrong thing, okay. Okay, yeah. he's a thief. But yeah. uh, I'm not saying he, he'll go to hell. I'm not okay. saying God will send him to hell because he stole. No, he may repent yeah. after doing wrong. I mean, it's, with every, every sin, it is like that, I think. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, fair enough, uh, Sheila. I think what you're saying is that you're making a statement of fact. Uh, you know, if someone has killed someone and you call him a murderer, that's a statement of fact, isn't it? Uh, that's perfectly all right. But you may want to check your motives in saying that sometimes. Because the Bible does say if you call somebody a fool, uh, you have already murdered him in your heart. You know, in other words, your motives are now becomes very important. And so if your motive is to put him down by calling him a thief, then uh, uh, the problem is that you are actually hurting yourself. You know, you are moving into an area which is dangerous. Uh, that's all I can say at this moment. <laughs> I don't know if somebody else has any extra thoughts on that. Please feel free to chip in. Okay. Right. Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Uh, uh, this uh, one of the will of God is that he that looks to the Lord Jesus Christ, where uh, it's mentioned in the, in the Gospel of John, and believes in Him who sent Him, will not come under uh, condemnation or be judged, but has uh, has everlasting life, will not come under condemnation, but has passed over from death to life. What, I, what I'm trying to say is, in Christ we are made whole. Mm -hmm. Salvation makes us whole, completes our creation. Christ is the center point of our life. It's our life. Christ is life. When Christ is in us, we tend not to, we have the help and strength to perceive as the opening prayer says, receive and perceive. And, uh, and uh, you know, we learn and grow. With Christ, we are limited in what Sheila was saying, if we are in Christ. This is uh, uh, more of our natural, unconverted nature that we would uh, want to, you know, uh, jump to 
jump to uh, you know judge somebody and uh, you know even worse still so uh, uh, what i mean is that uh, sheila has a very valid point but uh, uh, we have to uh, we have to know that we are in christ and we ne we need to uh, better our attitude towards uh, what christ would uh, the attitude christ would have should be our attitude i hope i haven't confused you all <laughs> uh, if i can just uh, if i can just say that you know judging is not wrong in fact the bible tells us stop judging by mere appearances but judge correctly so judging is necessarily not wrong but condemning is wrong because then you have taken upon yourself the uh, the prerogative to uh, to pronounce the final verdict on this person that only god has but we do we judge on a daily basis and we judge other people on a daily basis if you if you know somebody is going to mug you as you walk along the street you're not going to go walk into his arms would you i mean you want to walk you want to run away so you may have you are making judgments so it's not wrong to judge so you have to understand how judgment is being used but if you're going to pronounce a uh, uh, condemnation then of course it becomes uh, you know you are you have crossed the line does that make sense anybody else any thoughts on that why why i brought up the can i can i say something yes go ahead uh, why i mentioned about jesus christ in the scriptures mentioned i don't know in which letter but it's mentioned that we follow the example of jesus christ who did not sin nor was guile or lies found in his mouth deceit found in his mouth when he was reviled he did not revile back when he suffered he did not threaten but committed judgment to the father Uh, sometimes, uh, especially the last part, I sometimes uh, fail in the last part. Uh, when we suffer, we tend to, uh, and I'm working on it. We tend to, uh, you know, uh, hit out, or, or you know, emotions take over, or whatever. We forget that we have to commit the matter to the Father, <laughs> to judge who judges uh, rightly. Um. I, you must be careful that you don't. You have to, uh, you know, take these scriptures within its context. Jesus Christ called the Pharisees hypocrites. He called them whitewashed tombs. Right now, uh, did uh, did he revile them? Well, you see, the context helps us to understand something. Uh, the way Jesus did it was in in a in a uh, in a righteous manner. So judgment can be done in a righteous manner. okay but you have to be careful that uh, you know you don't cross the line like we said a little earlier uh, uncle zack ah uh, shanti yes i noticed you are uh, uh, you had uh, unmuted go ahead uh, yes uh, i i believe there is a uh, uh, what do you call it there is a slight difference between rebuking or judging judging rather judging and rebuking in love or correcting okay uh most of the times what we do is uh, as humans we are very quick to when we when we judge we are very quick to like say this is you this is this is that yes and as you very rightly put it the motives matter a lot mm -hmm. but to call out a mistake and to call out something that is plainly wrong is our prerogative as a christian too according to the word of the lord and so there is a fine fine uh, line between Uh, like auntie sheila was talking about you know saying you are a thief that is a true statement he might he he must be a, i mean he is thieving so you're calling him a thief yes but yeah. then to call out and to reach out in a way that in love where you can change that person if there is a possibility to bring that person to uh, reproach and to change is what we are asked to do isn't it matthew 18 says if your brother sins against you or anybody call out a mistake rather go and tell him his fault between you and him alone if he listens to you you are again your brother but if he does not listen take one or two others along so that you know there is accountability for that person so there many times that the thief is maybe into a continual habituation and addiction of thieving like pickpockets you know but yeah. then more people so all these verses are there for example uh what do you call it brothers if anyone is caught in any transgression you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness so all of this is still 
we can't call it judging, but we yeah. are rebuking, stating, calling out the transgression and saying, yeah. in love, we would like to stand with you. If you have a if you have an addiction that you think that you're not able to come out of, and this is clearly a problem with you. If right. this is a problem, then I would like to help you. And still they don't listen. You take elders and you say, we would like to help you, you know, extend it in gentleness and in love. And if he still doesn't, yes, of course, like you put up the judgment. Uh, at the end of the day, it is he who is rejecting the, the love of Christ through us and the love of Jesus Christ himself. And so what happens to him, he is accountable at the end of the day. Right. I think it's a good point that the fact that we correct others, we are called to, to, to correct others is, is a form of judgment. Now we, we are uh, afraid to use the word judgment there, but uh, it's a form of judgment. But uh, let's be careful that we don't get into the final judgment mode <laughs> where you condemn the person. Yeah. One thought I would like to add to. Yes. One thought I would like to add to what we are discussing is, uh, as we were studying, uh, we were also came across this question: the difference between judgment and condemnation. And uh, theoretically, this is how that uh, these are explained. Uh, these two differ on their motivation or intentions. The intention of judgment is discipline, restoration, correction, and helping them to grow and to change. The intention behind condemnation is destruction. So when you take condemnation, it always leads to death, destruction and there is no other way it takes. There is no other turn it can take. But a judgment, when it comes, it can be sometimes restorative, some can, sometimes it can be discipline and other things. So yeah. these two things are deferred based on the intentions. Right. I think that's a very good point, Praveen. Uh, you know, to, to understand that uh, judgment, you know, uh, uh, has those various contexts. It can be restorative. And you see that God is a restorative judge. I mean, Jesus Christ is a restorative judge. I mean, the fact that he would go to the cross, he's not interested in condemnation. But then the unfortunate thing is the existential reality that we are in is the fact that our choices have consequences. And that is where the whole concept of hell and, you know, uh, eternal punishment, all that thing comes. Even at that point, the good news we find from the scripture is, oh, God is a God who judges people. And in the Old Testament, we see people were celebrating the judgment of God. And in fact, they were asking and crying to God to bring his judgment upon themselves. God bring and judge. They were asking God to judge. So right. they have noticed and understood his judgments are always uh, <coughs> constructive. That's what they realized. Uh, even in the New Testament, we use, uh, if you read, most of the places, God's judge, whenever it is written about God's judgment, he was used as a judge only. And when it is, the Bible uses the word condemnation in certain places, whenever the condemnation is used, and it is used in the context where uh, the freedom was given into the hands of the people. Like, you know, God, light came into the world, but people like the darkness. God did not send his son to judge the world. Uh, and uh, condemn the world and people condemn themselves whoever did not believe in him who is it god who is condemning them no the scripture says they condemn themselves in fact they live in condemnation already uh, because they did not put their faith in jesus christ so when uh, in the bible also the distinction was already always maintained uh, that god is a god uh, of jud jud judging god his judgments are always uh, uh, constructing and uh, restore uh, restorative and yes. when it comes to condemnation and the freedom and the choice was always been left into the hands of humans right that we can clearly see yeah yes reka you had a thought yeah yes i thought judgment always restores order and for order to be there the judgment has to be there even if it is uh, it could be a rebuking or it could be condemnation but it has to be there because law does uh, demand that. Okay. Not condemnation. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, we do understand the, the retributive side of condemnation, but the way we look at 
you know, a judgment from God's perspective is always restorative because our judge is Jesus. <laughs> you know, isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus Christ is our judge? And how does he judge? I mean, he's not, he's not you know, uh, very quick to take out his sword and, and start hacking off heads. <laughs> he says, put your sword away. You know, I mean, he wants to see restoration. But the unfortunate thing is, if he is a God of love, he has given us the freedom to choose. And it is, we condemn ourselves. It is not who God has to condemn us. Uncle Zach? Yes. Shanti, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to actually, before you said that, I wanted to add this point and you brought that same thing up. Uh, okay. Our God is a fair judge. It's mm. all over the Bible. He is a fair God, um, a fair judge rather, and a righteous judge. When we see these uh, concepts, both in the Old and the New Testament. And uh, how amazing it is that my fate doesn't lie in the hands of people. Uh, you know, the, the, my rather my life, rather my my judgment is not being given by human beings, because had it been so, I would have been not fair, judged fairly. They would have yeah. brought up old hurts. They would have brought up a lot of things, you know. Whereas at the end of it all, the Lord always looks through the lens and the uh, uh, lens of grace and the lens of, uh, uh, you know, mercy. Fairness. Well, you are, you will always be this, isn't it? You, how much ever, every day my mercies are new to you, but yet you fall short. I know that you require my help. And yes, at the end of the day, I'm giving you a free choice and you're choosing me. Yes, you're faltering. Yes. But nevertheless, you have chosen to be and to try the next time. If I don't keep trying to be that just because it's like that, no, just because yeah. you've been given grace, will you keep doing that mistake? Then when it comes at the end of it, then yes, that will be upon me that I have. I am the one who has not accepted that free grace. It is me. I'm bringing that. I'm rejecting that all this and I'm saying I want judgment on me. Come, show me. So I feel that it is it is better and I'm so blessed that we are not judged by our peers. We are not judged by our parents. We are not judged by our friends and siblings because they would be our worst enemies, all of the people. I'm so glad that we are judged by the Lord who is fair and who is righteous at the, at the end of it all. Well, amen to that. And I think hey, you've come to hey, May I just yeah. one last uh, comment? Go ahead. One last comment to these matters. We spoke much about uh, judgment, and in fact, I appreciate you have brought quite a, a comprehensive uh, te teaching and presentation on this. Perhaps I feel we, we would uh, be needed to deal with, uh, as we're talking about this topic, three aspects as well, which may complete according to my limited understanding. We spoke about judgment, but we did not discuss what justice is. We spoke about judgment and we did not uh, speak much. In fact, to an extent, we spoke about the judge. I, to an, we could do justice. I mean, we could uh, uh, touch that subject to an extent. Uh, yeah. But justice, we did not touch. Perhaps if we talk about the justice, uh, bring some aspect of that, that would have uh, covered well. And uh, one last thing, one last, last aspect, if we could add to what you have already said, would have been much more helpful. That is... Uh, 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 how this concept of judgment uh, has been developed. What is this Christian understanding of judgment? What is Jewish understanding of judgment? How it has been influenced? Because most of the times, the moment we hear the word, we take scriptures from Old Testament, New Testament, all over and say oh, everywhere it is the same concept, but it is not. People's understanding has been changed over a period of time and Bible clearly shows that. So, <coughs> that particular journey <coughs> would have been more helpful. Kindly don't consider what I said as a, uh, what we'll call, usually we give feedback to our sessions. No, no, not in that sense. I guess these two topics, these are the these are some of the aspects, even in our personal time, if you could explore, that would give us a better understanding. That's what I wanted to mention. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, and that'll be your, your assignment, right? <laughs> so uh, you'll you'll do your research and bring all of that stuff because that that's a very important one and it's going to be huge. I mean, it's uh, it needs time to develop that. But 
uh, we've come to the end of our time. And, uh, you know, I think we need to rejoice. Like even as Shanti said, and uh, uh, Praveen said, uh, we don't have to fear judgment. Uh, we, you know, we don't come under judgment, uh, those of us who believe in Christ. And so uh, don't think you are, your final exam is still away and you have to cram. <laughs> you have to sit for your final exams. Uh, don't worry about that. You know, I mean, our Lord Jesus has done the final exam for us. So can I see a smile on everybody's face? Why are you so serious? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. And I hope uh, uh, the study was useful. And uh, let me see. Um, Shanti, you're still with us? Yes, Uncle. I'm just wondering if you could close in prayer for us, please. Thank you. Yes, I can. Let's pray. Holy Eternal Lord God Almighty, how we worship you, we glorify your holy name, and we exalt your name on high, O oh Lord, indeed, because you are worthy. Your son is worthy of praise and for the love sacrifice that he has given for us. Father, we thank you. And for the Holy Spirit that continually guides us, O oh, Abba Father, we thank you, O oh Lord, for these, uh, for this um, amazing gift of salvation that you've given uh, upon us. Father, we thank you, therefore we know that you are with us. We thank you that you are a loving God. We thank you that you are a just, fair, and a righteous one. Father, for we know that our righteousness is filthy rags. If we were to be judged, O oh Lord, O oh Master, we will be, uh, we will deserve only Hades, O oh Lord Jesus. But Lord, out of your abundance of grace and love, you have chosen us, you have called us, uh, you have given us your gift of salvation, and you purified us, O oh Lord Jesus, to be called worthy. And Lord, O oh Master, and so because of your righteousness, Lord, we stand before you and we say, thank you. Thank you for purifying us. Thank you for being called as your co-heirs. Father, we want to thank you and we want to bless uh, Pastor Dan for, uh, for the study that he has brought. Father, for all that he has researched and all that you've spoken to him and put in his heart of Father and the way that he has uh, given us the uh, session today. Father, we pray that you'll bless him, that you will tend to his every need. Father, at the same time, O Lord, each one of us, as we have heard this, Father, we know that the, this uh, particular topic is very vast and there are a lot more questions, maybe a lot more things that we are still grappling with or we are not going to master. In either way, wherever we stand, Father, we pray that you will give us your peace that passes all understanding, that in due time you will open up our eyes and understanding to hear what you're saying and to hear even deeper, O Lord Jesus, about all of these aspects of judgment, about the second coming, about the end days, about any other question that we might have. For we know, O Lord Jesus, that understanding and wisdom comes from you. And Lord, your word clearly says in James, O Lord, those who lack, we may ask and it will be given to us, O Lord Jesus. And so we pray today, O Lord, open up our eyes, open up our ears to hear your voice. And, and Holy Spirit, give us more and more of you, O Lord Jesus, so that we can understand your words better. And Lord, knowing for sure that even though we don't understand fully well now, Lord, that you are still in control over our lives and that you are our Lord and our Savior forever. We thank you once again for this time. We pray that you'll continue to minister to us, Holy Spirit. And as the days go by and we come back for another week, for another topic or a, an extension, Father, we pray that you'll protect and guard each one of our hearts. We bind ourselves to you. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. And thank you all for joining us. God bless you. Have a good evening. <laughs>